All right. Hello, everybody. I believe that we are now live. I hope so. I hope that's the case. Um, my name is Matthias Olson. I'm the founder of Campfire Stories, which is a film and podcast platform. Um, welcome to this event, which will circle around compassion. Um, we will see two short films, one uh, which was directed by me and another one which was... Yeah, I cannot hear you. I don't know why. You can't hear me? I think we just had Charles come on, but he's having some technical difficulties. All right, we'll see if we can work that out. I hope that I'm on and that people can hear me. So I'll just continue to talk and hope that uh, people can hear me. So um, before we get everything started, I'd like to introduce all the beautiful, wonderful people that are on this call. Um, and I'd like to begin with my um, trusted partner and colleague, uh, Boris Leible, who um, has helped me with many projects for Campfire Stories. He's a, um, a sound, uh, what do you call that? I'll let him introduce himself briefly. Um, Boris, hello. 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 Um, do you want to introduce yourself or do you want me to introduce you? Sorry, I cannot hear people. Uh, Hello. Yeah. All right. Boris? Can everybody hear me? No? Yeah, I think everybody can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Boris. Okay. Hi to everybody. It's a big pleasure to be part of this event. And yes <laughs> um yeah i worked a lot with matthias and mainly sound and did some music and cutting and it's always a pleasure so thank you excellent thank you boris and thank you for being here today um we'll see if uh, we have, um, I know we have Charles Eisenstein on the call, but he's having some technical difficulties, so I won't introduce him just yet. Um, I'd like to introduce the, the person who's making the technical aspects uh, flow, uh, who is live editing between this um, Zoom call and the films that we'll be watching. His name is Mike, and he's actually right here next to me. We'll see if we can, maybe he can pull up an image. There's Mike. Um, he's muted, so we won't hear him, but he's right here and he's, he's a rock solid person making this happen. Um, moving along, we have also um, Art Archie Pasanen with us. She is um, with the Swedish Transition Network, but today she is uh, helping us with moderation. She's going to be monitoring the chats from all the places where this live stream occurs. Um, Archie, you want to say hello? Hi everyone. So yeah, you can just type your questions in uh, whatever forum you're uh, watching this from and I will deliver them to the people who you are asking the questions from. Yeah, thank you for letting me be part of this very nice event. Beautiful. Thank you, Archie. Archie. <laughs> Um, we also have, um, uh, we're supposed to have, let's see here. Do we have Tim with us from Films for Action? No. All right. So no point in introducing him, uh, but I'm hoping that Tim will join us. Um, uh, but until then, let me introduce a wonderful filmmaker, a colleague, um, who is the director and producer, I believe, of the film Step Inside the Circle that we will be watching uh, shortly, uh, Fritzi Horstmann. Hi, Matthias, so great to be here. Thank you so much for having this event about compassion, which, um, which is my focus in my life, in the lives I, of the men and women I serve and in the lives of the men and of, of everyone. So just to bring more compassion. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, thank you for being here. I watched a, a short trailer of your film and was like, almost fell to the floor. So it's such an honor to have you here and to, to watch the full, the full short film. We'll get to that in a bit, I'm sure. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, and now I believe that Charles Eisenstein has the technicalities uh, worked out. Um, allow me to introduce a person who has meant a lot for me and his books have turned my life inside out and upside down in a good way. Uh, Charles Eisenstein. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, hi, Matthias. Really happy to be here. And yeah, really looking forward to, to our program. Excellent. Thank you so much. And we'll see if Tim from Films for Action uh, shows up soon too. Um, all right, let's just jump right into it, shall we? Um, the, first, the first thing that I would like to introduce um, is Fritzi Horstmann's project, Step Inside the Circle. But instead of me introducing it, I would like to let Fritzi do that herself. So Fritzi, go ahead. Um, so Step Inside the Circle is, a, it's actually, the trailer is now the short film. We decided that because we weren't allowed to go back into prison to finish the film we had in mind, we just said, what the hell, let's just make this the film. Um, so it is now, it's, the trailer is now the film. It is no longer a trailer. Um, we made that February 12th, right before COVID hit. Um, and we had three cinematographers on that day. One of them is Martin Scorsese cinematographer, uh, Rodrigo Prieto. So. Uh, I believe the universe is moving at warp speed to get this message out that the men and women living in prison are not, are not maligned, are not, there's nothing wrong with them. They just need a little support, a little compassion and to heal their trauma like all of us. So uh, my mission at the Compassion Prison Project or our mission at the Compassion Prison Project is to bring compassion to the men, women, living and working in prisons um, because the men work men and women working in prisons are also traumatized and the only way we're going to shift anything is if we have compassion for everyone so um shall we bring shall we show the film and maybe have some questions afterwards sorry i was muted um, can we just maybe just get a tiny little bit of a glimpse of who is Fritzi Horstmann, like a little bit of a, um, I don't know, just a, a little flavor. A little Fritzi glimpse. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've been a filmmaker. Um, I've been a very needy, need to be seen filmmaker since I was uh, 20 years old. Um, I worked in Hollywood for the past 30 years. Um, the minute I walked into prison, my entire life changed. I walked, I worked, I went to this thing called Hustle 2.0, where we teach um, the in incarcerated people how to become entrepreneurs. I was hooked the second I walked in. I said, when are we coming back? I was told not for six months. And I said, okay, I got to do something. It was a calling. It was a loud calling. And um, I haven't looked back since. I quit my job in Hollywood. I'm focused and devoted on bringing trauma-informed care, trauma-responsive care, uh, human, human and health services to all men and women living in prison and uh, to shift the paradigm in our society of, of abuse, dehumanization and annihilation. So that's a little about me. Um, I have a kid, an amazing kid, Conrad, and a, a magnificent husband, uh, Kip. And uh, we live in Los Angeles with our dog, Rocco. And, um, and I love all of the people that I can't even see. I love everyone here. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can all make a difference together. So thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that intro. Uh, before we see your film, I just would like to uh, also introduce Tim, who is uh, on the call now, I believe. Um, Tim, are you with us? Yeah, I'm here. Would you mind, do you want to switch on your video for a second and say hello? Uh, let me see here. Hey everybody. Nice. Awesome to be doing this. Excellent, thank you so much, Tim. And for those of you who may not know, uh, Tim is the, what do we call you? The, the founder of uh, Films for Action. Director of Films for Action, yeah. Do you want to just say very briefly what Films for Action is and does? 
Yeah, Films Fraction is a library for people who want to change the world. Uh, we have 5,000 videos that people can watch indexed by 34 different subjects all related to changing the world from permaculture to the environment to uh, politics, economics, community, city solutions, uh, the big picture, just everything. Um, a thousand free documentaries uh, indexed and several dozen pay-per-view films. Um, so yeah, it's just a huge kind of resource library. Our whole goal was to put all of the best social change films in one place to be easily accessible online. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Tim, for the work that you do. And um, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, whenever Netflix doesn't deliver, you can always go to Films for Action and, and, uh, and get some quality documentary. Exactly. Nice. Yeah, for sure. All right, uh, back to uh, Fritzi. Um, before we switch on your film, which will happen momentarily, I would just like to uh, encourage the viewers, the listeners to think of questions because right after the film, we will do a, a Q and A session. So if you have a question for Fritzi, um, put it in the chat and Archie will hopefully manage to, to uh, check five places for the chat simultaneously. And, and, uh, and, and, we may, and if there's a lot of questions, we may not get to your question. And if we don't, then I apologize, but we will try to get to as many as we can. And with that being said, if, unless anybody wants to add anything at this point, and if not, then I think it's, it's high time that we show uh, step inside the circle, which is a seven or eight minute long f film. And after we've seen it, we can talk more about it with Fritzi. All right, Mike, let's make it happen. trauma circle is everyone ready to face their past with compassion is that a yes? yes while you were growing up during your first 18 years of life if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often would swear at you insult you put you down or humiliate you step inside the circle If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or threw something at you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, step inside the circle. If you often felt that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, step inside the circle. If your family lived in extreme poverty, step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Good to see you. How are you? you amen. Noel. Noel, good to see you. Honey. Welcome. I was abused as a young girl. I was beaten by my mother. I was verbally abused by my mother. 
I was sexually abused by another man. My father was an alcoholic. My mother was a rageaholic. I've driven drunk. I've sold drugs. I was a juvenile delinquent. Probably my story is similar to most of your stories in here. I'm white and I'm female and I didn't, nothing happened to me. So, you know, I got a get out of jail free card. And so I'm here now because I see myself in every one of you. I'm a traumatized child raised by a traumatized child. My mother was traumatized as well as her parents. Like he said, we wasn't born in the world of being evil people. My mother didn't want me. She hid her pregnancy. And she tried to flush me down the toilet. But as I learned about these things, I always asked myself what was wrong with me. When I come to the circle and I see everybody else and she's reading off the questions and people step it in further, and I look at my childhood and I'm like, a lot of these people in this yard are just like me. There was one step I should have taken that I didn't take and I saw some of my brothers and my friends take that step and I felt like such a coward. You know, I wasn't brave enough to be there with them when they took that step. And um, every round after that, I, I took the most difficult step. Our traumas kept us separated. We were all on the circumference, all standing apart. But once we began to acknowledge our traumas publicly, it brought us all closer together. In prison, you're not supposed to show your weaknesses in prison though. But to, 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 to want to do that, to walk in that circle like that and to take each step forward was a reminder to ourselves that we still have a humanity and we worthy to be loved though. Most people on the outside don't understand that we want to change so we can re-enter society better than what we left it. And I think one of the things that when you was yelling at no shame and you had us yelling it out, it was freeing us too. And it was a point to where when I was looking at that and we was all looking at it, in a circle you can hear that echo, no shame. Yes. And that was very powerful, especially coming from a little lady like you. <laughs> I'm 76 years old, I've seen a lot. I don't like talking. I like to meet people that understand what's happening without words, and you one of them. The day has been one of the best days I had in my whole entire life since I've been out here these four years. Your true spirits are not violent. Your true spirits are magnificent. All right, everybody, we're back um, with our crew here. Um, I, um, this film is so powerful and I'd love to hear more about it. And I have tons of questions and maybe 
actually, before we head, uh, give the word to Archie to see if uh, any of the viewers have any questions, I'd like to ask if there's anybody um, here on the call that, that want to kick this off and have a question for, for Fritzi. Actually, while you think about that, I have one. So I'll just do one and then you get a chance to do one and then we uh, open up to the viewers. Uh, so Fritzi, I'd like to know, um, it seemed like from, from the moment this film begins, it seems like you have everybody's uh, trust, but I imagine that it must have been a process to, to gain everybody's trust. Can you talk a little bit about like what happened in the process leading up to like the, the first film moment that we see here? Well, actually, um, I stepped into Lancaster prison a month before we started filming and I got to know Sam, Samuel Brown and he's actually in Honor Yard, which is the, another film that we have available for people to see. Sam organized everyone and he, he basically said, trust me. And Victor, the really big guy that his mother tried to flush him down the toilet, he said, who is this little lady? And he calls me a little lady a lot. He still does. He just got out. Uh, uh, Victor's out now. Um, who is this little lady and what is, can we trust her? So I brought donuts and I think that's one of the things that signaled that, okay, she's, she's, she's advocating for us. They, they wouldn't let us bring lunch, by the way. They, I could only bring snacks. Um, so the trust was kind of, they kind of just went for it. And, and what happened was alchemy, of course. Of course, the minute someone says, I care about you, even if it's a little lady in the middle of a, of a circle, things start to change. And that's my feeling is when we start caring for each other, when we make a stand and say, I care for you, everything begins to change. And so they saw that my intentions were honorable, that I cared about them. And, and you can see it in the, we, we, the second part of the film, we, we filmed that on another day. And we got to, uh, my intention was to go back and film 30 or 40 more of the men and get their stories and their stories. This, my, my sense is when people hear what happened to these men in their childhood, um, there will be a great forgiveness. And um, I have stacks of letters of, of these stories. And, um, and that's what we need to start addressing is how we're dehumanizing each other in our own families and in our own, in our schools, in the streets, in our politics, on social media. That's that's the work we have. And where are we putting our own violence out into the world? Our microaggressions within our families, our microaggressions to ourselves. And that's, um, that's the message that I wanna make sure everyone who tunes into the, you know, this unified field starts taking responsibility for is, is their own con contribution of love or violence and what is it? Where are we dehumanizing ourselves? So I know I just ranted a little. <laughs> no. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, does anybody else on this call have a question? And if not, no. So I'll pass it on to Archie and see if she has anything from the viewers. Yes, actually, there are quite a few questions uh, dropping in and uh, a lot of um, People are very happy about uh, and commenting that it's a very strong film and very grateful for it. So I just want to let you know that there's many people who, who think this is a very beautiful project. Um, one question that is uh, coming up is the question on if you have any follow-up studies on how your compassion session has changed things for the prisoners and if you will go back uh, and how they are doing now? Ah, uh, that's a lot of questions. Um, so first off, I will be going back. Uh, I, COVID happened, we filmed February 12th and then February 19th and then we were about to go back and they said no, all, all visits from anybody or all, no one's allowed to enter um, the prison, the prison walls. So we will be going back. Um, right now, we're getting, we're getting some trauma-informed materials to them so that they can explore 
in more depth about what trauma does to the brain, body, and spirit. Um, and the, the, the feedback from that day, a lot of that, that feedback came in the filming that we did on the second day. But also I've heard from dozens of people how much this, this day meant to them. And um, we also, one of the posts we, we just did on, a, on our website or, or in our social media was um, from our class at, at Kern Valley State Prison and how, how our class affected them, which the trauma circle was the big part of the class. So um, they say it, it's a game changer and that this work got to the root of their violence and why, they're, why they committed crimes. Because when you're traumatized, uh, the amygdala takes over and the prefrontal cortex shuts down. The amygdala sends a signal to the body putting you in fight or flight or freeze. And your body does everything, your body takes over. And it's, the game is off for doing something moral, doing something correct. Why does a policeman fire shot, seven shots into a man running away? Because his body is doing that, he's not doing that. And yet we, we let the men and women that work in the police department off, we don't let the men and women who do these crimes off in our society. And that's where we need to start really examining why we're annihilating people instead of helping people. And just, just another fact that everybody needs to know, the three largest health mental health centers is Rikers Island, the LA County Jail, and Cooks County Jail in, in Chicago. So those are our three mental health centers in the, in the United States. That's, and the way we treat them is to continue trauma and to de dehumanize put them in solitary confinement, and in some states, put them to death when they're acting out of their amygdala and not, not out of the great, the great perfection that they really are. Um, so there is um, um, a question connected to that, and uh, that is, uh, do you think that the private corporate system of US prisons is a big problem in truly addressing the healing of the inmate instead of seeing them and judging them instead of a bad person, making them basically cheap slave labor. What's your comment on that? Um, I think I'm really just gonna pivot that question slightly to the 13th Amendment, which is, it actually uh, condones human trafficking in our society. The 13th Amendment says that if you are a prisoner, you are, it's okay for you to be a slave. And so um, basically in our constitution, we've condoned slavery and we've condoned the acts of dehumanization. And so that's, it really, we must get to our founding documents um, and shift those before, we can, we can cite the private prisons, but it's, the state prisons are just as annihilating and dehumanizing. And solitary confinement, there's 60, there were 6,700 people, 67,000 people in solitary before COVID, and now there's over 300,000. Um, Nelson Mandela says that more than 15 days, the Nelson Mandela rules say that more than 15 days in solitary is torture. Mm -hmm. So there are men, I've worked with men 10 years, 30 years. What happens when you're in solitary is you don't have a reference point of, of other people. So you can't see yourself. You can't see yourself reflected. And what happens is you go insane. And so we're basically an insane asylum. Um, we're, and we're condoning creating insane people. I hope that answers some of that. Um, is there time for more questions? Maybe one last one or how? <laughs> Muting and unmuting. Uh, yeah, we actually, we have about 10 more minutes, so we're good for a few more questions. Okay, no, good. So um, another question that popped up is um, following. Uh, is the, there is no shame referring specifically to having been abused or suffering poverty, or is it the more general statement? The idea of shame, my feeling is there is no shame. There's accountability but there is no shame. We need to er eradicate shame because shame is the act of dehumanizing yourself. And so instead of dehumanizing ourselves, if we, if we move up, there's a, there's a scale uh, by David, 
God is, um, I forgot this. I'm just a little nervous. So I forgot the scale, but shame is at the lowest level. It's at 20. And then, oh God, Hawking's, the Hawking scale. I'm sorry. Um, so he says that shame is at, at 20. And the vibration, Jesus and Buddha were up at a, at a thousand. And it, as you go up the scale, it exponentially increases. Um, so to keep ourselves at the lowest level, shame, shame creates addiction, shame creates um, suicide. Um, it creates the ideas that, that you're just not worthy and it's just a lie. So my sense is if we take accountability for, the, for what we've done, and this is also for the United States and what we've, they've done to the people living in prison, we take accountability. We say, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. But if we shame people, if we shame the people about slavery from 400 years ago, things aren't going to shift. The idea is to shift. We got to shift. We have to raise up and shift each other. So if we shame each other, things aren't going to shift, um, which is why I believe there is no shame. There's accountability. Uh, you know, I'm responsible for the violence in my home when I've um, yelled at my son or when I've criticized my husband. I'm taking accountability for it. And every time it happens, each time it happens, I'm less and less violent and less and less unconscious. And that's, that's where we all need to, you know, take responsibility and move on and let's make a new world. And has your class changed the management of the prison? That's, the answer is no. And that's why we're creating, we've created a curriculum. First of all, we've created a thing called adopt a prison. And the idea is that people from the outside will donate and adopt a prison. And then we will bring trauma informed training to the, to the officers and the staff. And we'll, we will bring a trauma informed curriculum to every single person living in prison so that they know about their traumas and their behavior, that their behavior is, is connected to their trauma. It's not connected to their being. And that's a really important distinction. When I found out, I have eight ACEs. I don't know if you would know what an ACE is. It's an adverse childhood experience. It's a test created by Vincent Folletti and Robert Anda from the CDC and Kaiser 20 years ago. I have eight of 10 ACEs. And the more ACEs you have, the more, more adverse health effects you have. Um, four or more ACEs, you're seven times more likely to go to prison. And so when I found out that I was traumatized, that my road rage wasn't, wasn't from something that I, um, something of who I was, it was because I was traumatized and my body was keeping me safe. It changed my whole perception of who I was. And my promiscuity as a, ch as a teenager and a young woman, my, um, my need to have a drink my workaholism, all that is just my body trying to keep me safe because the trauma, as Thomas Hubel, Hubble says, trauma is, is stored in our bodies as ice. And, um, you know, putting awareness on it brings the ability to heal and to melt that ice. And that's collectively what we need to do in our society is we need to start seeing our traumas as something actually something magnificent, something that, that will, once, once we see it, it can help us transform and bring compassion to each other. Um, that's the trick of trauma. Trauma is a magnificent thing once it's realized. And um, that's why I want to bring ACEs to, to, the, to the general public, to the planet, so we can see what trauma is doing. And it's, it, the, um, forgot, I think it was, Gabor Mate said, I know it's Thomas Hubble again. He says, trauma is the thing that makes us feel separate from each other. And once we bring that into awareness, we can come together now and build a new world, build a new community, one community. I'm going to jump in. Sorry, Archie, but we have run, uh, run out of time. Uh, there will be another Q&A session at the end of this day, uh, <laughs> at this day, the end of this um, thing that we're doing. Um, so then you're free at that, in that Q&A, you're free to ask questions to anybody uh, of us. So you can 
we'll see if we can get back to Fritzi on that. But I want to ask uh, one last question to Fritzi, and that is, so if people who are watching this would like to get involved or support your, because there's a longer film that is brewing. Brewing, uh, we yes, hope. we're brewing. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> what do they do if they want to support um, you? Where, where yes, go? please go to CompassionPrisonProject.org and you can volunteer, you can donate, um, and also find out about your local prisons, find out about what's going on in your state, in your community, and how you can get involved in your communities and your returning citizens because of thousands of more people are coming out and they need, they need compassion, they need to be seen, they need to be valued, and they need to be hired. Um, but come to Compassion Prison Project. We're doing all kinds of things, trauma-informed prisons, or if you have a lot of money, adopt a prison. Let's go. Let's adopt all the prisons. There's 1,833 prisons in the United States. There's 5,000 correctional facilities in the United States. Every, every prison needs to be adopted because we're going to bring them mental health um, instruments, art classes, education, and we're transforming themselves. And when we transform them, we transform ourselves. So we're, this is like, we're all in this together and we need to just turn on the lights. So I love you all. Thank you. Thank you for watching my film and thank you for your, um, your magnificence. Thank you so much, Fritzi. And um, with that, um, I'd like to turn the microphone and the floor over to Charles Eisenstein, um, who has graciously agreed to be on this call and talk a little bit about compassion. So take it away, Charles. Wow. Well, is my uh, mic level good and we're all, everything good here? You can hear me? Yeah. I'll assume. I think so. It seems... Yeah, it seems good. Okay. Uh, Mike, next to me in the control room, is giving a right. thumbs up. Good. So, go. um, yeah. Wow. I, I just love that film and any work that is happening in the prisons. I, it had my my first visit to a prison had a big effect on me as well, Fritzy. Uh, I went when I was I think about about thirty years old with a with some Quakers, uh, a program called Alternatives to Violence. And, you know, I went in there <laughs> thinking that I was going to have something to, you know, teach these men. Um, but I soon realized that they, some of them at least, were, were far more evolved uh, psychologi psychologically and spiritually than I was. And that they had way more to teach me than I had to teach them. And that was my second, actually, when I was um, 20 years old, I was in jail, uh, you know, as a convict uh, for just a couple days. Uh, and that was also a profound experience, uh, like a life-changing experience, because <clears throat> before then I had no way of, of knowing that um, the, you know, that criminals were not like, like I, I, I just assumed um, from watching movies and, 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 you know, consuming media that criminals were of a lower sort, like a lesser stuff, like a lower grade of humanity. But when I went in there to this jail in rural Idaho uh, to serve my two day sentence for possession of marijuana, these were like really, these were full human beings. They were, curious about about me and my friend you know they were they were friendly they were i mean they had full personalities they're like showing me pictures of their kids you know telling telling us their stories um how, you know how they ended up you know committing armed robbery etc cetera, etc cetera. and i was like yeah you know if i were in your circumstances that could easily be me i could have been there and the reason that I am here and going back to Yale University in a couple days and that you are going to prison after jail uh, is by the grace of God. I am no better and no worse than you are. And that, that is really when, when, I, when I like, we ask what is compassion? That's what it is to me. It's the recognition of something fundamental in our humanity uh, that unites us. And, and for me, it's the understanding that if I were in the totality of your conditions, I might do very much as you have done. 
And, and it's the antidote to the kind of judgment that is almost second nature to people who have grown up in modern society, where like it's, it's so like, for example, the idea, well, you made bad choices. I mean, people take it on themselves also as um, what, what seems like a step toward responsibility and ownership of their lives. And there is a truth in this too. But basically, if the reason that you committed that violent act is because um, of a trauma, a PTSD response, and your amygdala took over, like, actually, it's not true that you made a bad choice in that moment. So the whole paradigm of punishment and deterrence that rests upon that uh, belief, um, it's, it's, it reveals it as, as, as futile and destructive uh, and, and a recipe for endless war, endless war against those that we have cast into the realm of, of bad people, of bad guys, of enemies. Uh, and, and so this whole solution uh, is um, never going to change our society. In fact, it perpetuates the way that things are right now, producing an endless crop of new enemies. So I really, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really moved by that film. I, I think that, you know, today there's a lot of people who want to save the world. And, and you look at the situation and, and you know, some people, think that the biggest threat to humanity is climate change. Some people think maybe it's the threat of nuclear war. Some people think that it is, uh, I don't know, electromagnetic pollution from all the new satellites that are going up. I mean, there's many, many things to identify as the cause or the, or the biggest threat. But something in me understands, th and this is knowledge that I got when I was uh, in that program in the prison, that if we continue to lock people up and to, as Fritzi said, to annihilate them, the most vulnerable people, the most harmed people, if we continue to do that, then there is no hope either for the most vulnerable places on earth, the most vulnerable parts of ourselves. There's, there's nothing is going to change if we keep doing that. And that there is a, this is the, another thing that I realized at that time, there is a causal principle operating in this world that is alien to the modern mind based on force. The modern mind thinks that causality is a matter of a force acting on a mass. So we have, for example, a prison system, maybe not so much in you know, Sweden, but in most countries, a prison system based on force, the concept of deterrence is a force-based concept. We're gonna, yeah, I know you, you would, you would, if you could have your way, you would rob people and exploit people and, 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 um, and harm the world, but, but all, because all you care about is yourself. So we're going to impose a deterrent so that it is no longer in your self-interest to do these nasty things. It's based on a view of human nature that goes back all the way to uh, uh, Darwinian selfish genes. It goes even farther back to original sin. It goes even farther back to, to the, uh, the origin of good and evil as concepts, which do not occur to the ecological mind. That's a pretty long detour I took. Uh, but anyway, force, <clears throat> yeah, another causal principle is operating in the world. That, that, I, the, that when, when I am cognizant of that principle, I know that the work in the prisons and all of the other healing work uh, that might operate on a very small scale is having an enormous effect on the future pulling deep threads of causality that might not surface for many generations. Even though the rational mind says, okay, you know, 
yeah, maybe you're going to work with prisoners, but really in the context of climate change, in the, cl the context of nuclear Armageddon, what good is that going to do? These people are not going to be big influencers. You know, if you want to change the world, you better work with some influencers, not with some people who are going to come out of prison and maybe they're going to get a job at Chipotle if they're lucky. You know, you got to work with some influencers who are going to have a big platform and, and, and change people's minds. But the world doesn't actually work that way. When we set out to do big things, we end up competing with everybody else who's trying to do big things and adding to the field of competitiveness. Instead, if we want to tap into, and I'm supposed to be speaking about compassion, I'll, I'll tie it in later. Um, but if we want to um, align with the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, rather than pursuing bigness and the kind of change that we can measure that, has, that, that generates big quantities of here's how many prisoners we helped. But instead we focus on beauty. We focus on love. Then the bigger changes can uh, organically coalesce around that without our ambition for, to, for it to be big. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, it's the principle of morphic resonance that, that I often invoke, um, that Rupert Sheldrake uh, articulated, that, uh, that any change that happens in one place creates a field of change that makes that same change start happening everywhere else. So maybe you do adopt a prisoner, maybe you're just working with one prisoner who's come out now and is in society, and it seems really small. And part of you is like, this isn't going to help the world. It's just going to help one guy, you know? But actually what you are doing is you are reinforcing that field of compassion. And because you are doing that, it's going to start happening other places too. And it works the other way as well. Like what is moving in you that wants to act on compassion right now? that is sourcing from somewhere this impulse toward kindness, this impulse toward love. What is giving you courage to step out of self-interest, to step out of security, to step out of self-protection, to step out of the habits that trauma may have lodged within you, to say, you know what? I'm going to serve instead. I'm going to serve what I care about. I'm gonna serve what's beautiful. What are you drawing from, from when that happens? You are drawing from the invisible contributions of humble people who did just that and have been doing that for centuries, for, from time immemorial. And maybe they thought that they weren't changing the world, but they are through the vehicle of everybody who's tapping into that field. And if someday we have a political leader who also is taking those steps of courage, it's not that all of a sudden we elected a Superman. It's that the collective field had reached a point where such a leader could step into it. So yeah, I would say that compassion is, if we're gonna talk about saving the world, um, which I usually am averse to talking about uh, because of all the uh, false hero archetypes that it invokes. But if we're gonna even think in those terms, rather than all these technocratic solutions, and, and I mean, these, these are not unimportant, but if they don't have the foundation of compassion, if they're not tapping into this wellspring of energy that animates all of these things and generates the courage for us to, to adopt those technocratic solutions, say regenerative agriculture or, um, you know, prison abolition <laughs> or uh, cleaning up the water or the air. I mean, if, we're, if, 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 if it's not animated from by and, and drawing from the, the 
wellspring of compassion that brings us to courage. I mean, what is courage, really? We can talk about uh, being from the heart, but what has to happen for us to really act from the heart? Some kind of healing has to happen. So, so and without courage, by definition, we are serving ourselves in a very narrow sense, serving our safety as we can perceive it. That's the opposite of courage. So we need on this planet a lot of courage right now. And it does not do to simply exhort people to courage or to shame them, to try to use, shame is another kind of force, actually. It's the force of, <clears throat> of do it or else, stop it or else. And it originates in modern parenting methods that um, basically uh, leverage the child's uh, mammalian need for parental acceptance and the child's mammalian fear of parental abandonment. Punishment, it's not so much the physical pain that is effective on the child, it's the, it's the obvious repudiation of the child in that moment. So, so this is a type of, of primal force. It's the force of a gun to your head, do it or else, because that is the survival fear that is triggered through punishment uh, uh, or even like approval. <laughs> uh, when uh, approval is used manipulatively, uh, I accept you because you do this, I reject you because you do that. What's wrong with you? You're bad, you're, you're horrible, horrid little brat, that kind of language is operating on survival fear. Anyway, um, and that's actually a kind of a trauma too. You know, we can talk about the, the ACEs and the, the overt trauma, but in a way trauma is normalized in our society. And things that you're like, well, I should, you know, I mean, I didn't get beaten by my father. You know, I didn't get locked into a closet and made to eat my own vomit. You know, I didn't like all these horrible things that we hear, the kind of stories that, that Fritzy collects from, from these prisoners. Um, yeah, none, none of that happened to me. But on a more muted level, trauma is pretty much written into the fabric um, of our civilization because it draws on paradigms of the conquest of nature, the conquest of the self, rising above materiality, spirit and uh, body in opposition, um, like all of these deep paradigms that are, that are changing right now. And so, yeah. Shame being Actually, there's one other part of shame, though. All of these uh, expressions of our separation also have a seed of something else. Even shame, uh, in a healthy culture, shame is the realization of a disconnect between what you've actually been doing and who you, th who you actually are. And when that is exposed, the false self-image dissolves, liberating heat, and there's a flush to the face. And if, that, if, they're, if you're being held in total unconditional acceptance, then you're free to have that experience and to realize where you have been out of alignment with, with who you really are. But that's maybe a different conversation. Um, I just don't want to like completely write off shame as a bad thing. Uh, however, like so many beautiful and good things, it has been perverted uh, into an instrument of aggression, oppression, control, domination. Um, yeah, and I think we're all ready for something else, aren't we? Um, and I guess, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave a, maybe a little time for questions or something, but I'll, I'll just finish by saying, I, 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 the antidote 
to the, 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 the key to deprogramming ourselves, to unlearning the habits of judgment, the habits of shame, the habits of domination, um, is for me, it's a question. It's what is it like to be you? Instead of deciding you did that because you are something, because you are something, because innately you are different from me. That's why you did that bad thing. That's why you uttered that racist slur. That's why you, you know, uh, abused your, your partner. That's why you did these bad things. Instead of assuming that, we can ask, okay, well, where did that actually come from? What is your circumstance? What is the, not, and, and your life circumstance and your entire biography? Like, what is it actually like to be you? What's your story? Even if, you know, and, and sometimes people say, well, Charles, that's very white and privileged of you to ask such a question because some people don't have the luxury of trying to understand it. If you were really a victim, then you wouldn't be asking, what is it like to be you? You'd be trying to, you know, fight back or escape or something like that. And, and you know, this idea of compassion for the perpetrator, I mean, come on, the victims need a lot more compassion than the perpetrators. And to that, I say, compassion for the victims necessitates compassion for the perpetrators. Because if you want it to stop, if you want this, the, the, the abuse, the racism, the exploitation, the killing, if you, the, if you want this to stop, the misogyny, the transphobia, whatever it is, if you want it to actually stop, and then you have to understand where it's coming from. You have to meet it at its root. You have to address the, the, the conditions that cause it. And if you don't do that, the best you can hope for is an endless war of suppression of the expression of the conditions. Every new crop of criminals comes up, you'll lock them away and thereby destroy families and communities and generate even more trauma and the new criminals come up and you'll lock them away too. But if you ask, well, where is the crime coming from? Then maybe you have a chance and maybe sometimes you, you know, a violent person has invaded your home and you don't have time to do a thorough investigation and maybe you do have to run away. Or maybe you do, but, but so the problem isn't running away or fighting per se. It's the habit of doing of those things that is born of a way of seeing the world. So yeah, what is it like to be you? And underneath that, I'll just finish by saying, underneath that is a knowledge that something must have happened because your original being is, as Fritzi was saying, beautiful and perfect. So really all of this is premised on a view of human nature, that we are here to, to add to life and beauty in the world. That is the universal human purpose. We are here to give a gift to the world, to bring more life and beauty to the world. What stops us from recognizing that in ourselves? We come back again to trauma and we come back to the stories that are born of trauma and that create more trauma in our culture, the story of separation. So, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll pause there and Matthias, if you want to, uh, you can egg me on or bring up questions or something. Thank you so much, Charles. Um, I think, so you actually, you wrote a, uh, an essay a few years ago and the title of that essay was, this is how war begins, I believe. Hmm. And when I read that, I immediately had an idea 
of how to turn that into a film. And so that's actually the film that we're premiering. So I thought uh, I will introduce that film briefly and um, along with Boris, who also helped uh, a great deal on that film. And then we'll watch the film. And the, at the end, we have about 20 minutes of Q and A. And, and at that point, people can ask you or Fritzi or wh whomever they want. Um, but maybe just briefly before I go into the film, uh, because I think that the, the text or the essay, uh, this is how war begins. I believe that was written around the, the previous election. Is that right? Uh, I, I think so. I don't remember that essay real well, but yeah. Because it had something, it, it began with, um, you have to be an idiot to think right. Republican. You have to be like, it was bringing up some, some quotes from social media. Uh, but maybe in light of the recent election, uh, can you give us a, a super brief, I know this is impossible, but like a brief, if there's a, like an update. To oh my God. I mean, it's gotten so much worse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't know if my essays do any good at all because it's like, <laughs> yeah, both sides have the same diagnosis of the problem, which is the stupidity and wickedness of the people on the other side. They agree in their diagnosis, and I think that they're both wrong. And I think that that diagnosis prevents them from ever understanding the other side and from ever seeing their own blind spots. Because if, if, your, uh, if the correctness of your opinions is linked to your worth and value as a, as a soul, then, then of course you're going to continue to collect more and more other opinions and, and information that validates your own goodness. If you're insecure about your, your worth as a human being, then one way to build security is to surround yourself by an echo chamber of people who are constantly assuring you that, yeah, we're right, we're good, they're bad, they're wrong. If that's the emotional need that's being met, how are you ever going to um, impartially look at what you believe and recognize, oh yeah, actually maybe I was wrong about that because I didn't understand this person's situation and, that, and, and this information, I was walling it out because it didn't fit the story. Like, how are we ever going to come together? How is any side ever going to release their certainty? And it's not necessarily to meet in the middle. Often it's to meet completely outside of the debate that's happening. So, yeah, I mean, I could speak about this for hours, but, but um, it is the lack of compassion is related intrinsically to our political stuckness right now. Beautiful. Thank you. I would love to hear you talk about that for hours, but uh, we're on a strict schedule here. We have to try to make this fit into the box somehow. Um, so in, in that text that I referred to earlier, um, the... Um, this is how war begins, which you also turned into, a, a, there was a, a video version of that also, um, that maybe I can find that and link that in the, in the, in the chat at some point. Uh, but anyway, so what, what really stayed with me was the question, what is it like to be you? And, you know, so if I'm like consider, considering myself one of the good guys, then yeah, what is it like to be one of those people that I consider to be the bad guys, like the people who are working in forestry, for example, uh, making clear cuts? So what is it like to be one of those people who are, you know, operating one of those machines to clear cut forests? Um, it's easy to say, to think to yourself that they're stupid, they're idiots, and they're harming the, the world. It's much more difficult to think they're probably doing their best and they probably have, maybe they, I don't know, there's, there's most likely uh, qualities to them that I don't see. And um, anyway, so it was just triggering me to, um, to think of how could I turn this into a film? Actually, I, I didn't have to think about how to turn it into a film. The film entered my mind and mm -hmm. I wanted to do something that where um, we would just get to meet a lot of different types of people um, and I wanted the film to be centered around the question, what is it like to be you? Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky enough to be able to 
pitch this film to Swedish national television. And, and weirdly, I didn't think that like compassion was big on their agenda, but weirdly, beautifully enough, they uh, liked it. And so the film was co-produced with Swedish national television, was broadcast last spring. Um, and, um, and, and, and actually I, so we're going to watch the film in a moment, but before we do, I'd like to turn the word over to uh, Boris for a while because uh, there was no way that I was going to do all of this by myself. And I was into the cinematography bit and I was into the finding all of these different people to portrait, to make portraits of. Um, but I needed somebody, a wingman, to uh, to come on board to uh, to make the audio come alive. And so, Boris, maybe would you like to say a few words about um, how it was for you to work on this project? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I was very happy when when you asked me if I would like to be part of this project. I enjoy with, uh, working with you every time, but his, this time it was uh, special as compassion is very important. It's a very important thing to me. And the chance to get the message across is really an honor. Um, yeah, but to be honest, working with the film was mostly, uh, has mostly helped me, myself, to integrate more compassion into my life. Uh, every time I take the time to think about a decision in my life, all the different people we have filmed come to my mind and help me to make a smarter decision with more compassion. So thank you for that, Matthias. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, and um, yeah, you ask about um, the audio as well. Yeah. And I... Yeah, when, when we start talking about the film, I got this idea of um, editing the film live together with the audio. And it was a really interesting process to, uh, to get all the pictures and um, sitting in the studio doing the music. And during these sessions, um, the whole soundtrack and audio um, came up and yeah, it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Thank you. Are you, um, I don't want to cut you off, but are you, do you, are you, are you good? You want to say anything else? No, just want to see the movie. One right. more time. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So we're going to, to see the, the film, uh, which is about 13 minutes long, I believe. And, um, and anybody who wants to type questions in the chat, they can do that. Uh, Archie is uh, on the ball and checking out what you're writing. And remember, you can ask questions to Charles or to Fritzi or to anybody, uh, myself or Boris. Um, before we watch the film, I want to uh, acknowledge the people who came together because the film had a Swedish voiceover and a, a Swedish uh, sound track. And so we wanted to make the film available internationally without subtitles. So we created a Kickstarter campaign um, uh, about six months ago. And we had something like 70 backers help us uh, raise the money to be able to do the English audio version. So I really want to acknowledge those people for their beautiful contribution. Um, and with that set up, I think it's time to watch the film. Uh, I will say one thing um, before, and that is that this film is very meditative. So if in case you're watching this and you're used to like quick cuts and car chases and stuff, uh, you might be disappointed. Um, but I would suggest um, dimming the lights, maybe lighting a candle and turning the audio up so that you can hear Boris's beautiful work. Um, and uh, with that, I think we're good to go. And Mike, are you ready to cue the film? He's nodding his head. So here we go.
What's it like to be you? Would I have done the same? If I were in your shoes? If I were you, would I understand you? Is what I see really who you are? What lives inside of you? What makes you brave? What makes you scared? What's it like to be you? 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 What's it like to be
does life look like through your eyes? What's it like to be you? Right, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, so we have um, we're supposed to finish up in about twenty minutes. So there's uh, about 20, fifteen to twenty minutes worth of uh, Q and A uh, that we can do um, before we see if there are any questions coming in from the viewers. Um, let's see if there's anybody on our panel here that want to ask anybody else anything. I have a question. Um, when you made your film and you were filming them, what did you say to them before they got into that space? Because I felt like I got to connect with almost every, everyone you presented. So you were connecting with them, um, but I assume you didn't know everyone. 
No, I, I didn't know. I knew maybe three or four uh, of all of them. So most of them I didn't know. Um, I told them beforehand that this is probably going to be a little bit awkward because it's like taking a still picture, but the camera's just rolling and there's just silence and nothing going on. Um, so I'll be filming for, for quite a while to just get us through the awkwardness first. Um, so they all knew that, okay, it might be awkward and then it might be meditative and we'll see how long it takes. Like I didn't say exactly how long, but I said it might take a few minutes, maybe even five or 10 minutes. Uh, so I just uh, filmed and it, it was a little weird, like the first seconds and then like self-consciousness uh, appeared and, uh, and then it went away. And within one minute, most of them had, had gotten into some sort of um, most meditative state where they were just looking into the lens and, and they just were in the moment. And I had also instructed them to not um, like think of anything in particular, just to just look into the lens and not basically not use any muscle in the face, just be totally relaxed and look into the camera. And then for many of them, um, after a few minutes, it became like a boiling pot, is that a word? Like where it, the, the pressure built up and, and suddenly for no particular reason, they started laughing hysterically, which we thought, um, uh, actually maybe Boris can speak to that because he was the editor on the project. But um, yeah, do you want, to, you want to touch on that Boris about the, adding the laughter towards the end? Yeah, but I just want to add something about your question, Fritz, Fritzi. Um, I think one important thing is that it's in slow motion, so the audience get more time to get to connect to the people. So if you see them in slow motion, it really changed a lot when we tried it compared to real time. Um, yeah, and then about the, the ending, um, when we edited the film, um, we came to a state where we wanted, uh, we wanted to change the, the mood <laughs> a bit. And we, was, we were looking after a way to break up the... Um, the seriousness. Yeah, and the... Uh, this uh, state of meditation. So I, I looked through the material and I um, saw all the laughters and yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's perfect. So uh, to see another side of all the people we filmed. Uh, so I really liked the idea that First, we have the time to get to connected to them and then uh, um, see them relax and just laugh. So, yeah. Does anybody else uh, on the call have um, a question or should we hand it over to Archie? All right, Archie, do you have anything for us? Yeah, there. Uh, well, first of all, there has been a lot of crying people are commenting that they are crying of being so touched and moved and of how beautiful this movie film was um so giving you that from all the comments from all the channels um and uh, people really being grateful for for the opportunity to see this uh, and one question is uh regarding that in the end there um their pairs and why, what was the purpose of putting people in Paris in the end of the movie? Um, I think, I mean, there was one uh, couple who were a couple in the early portion and then they remained a couple in the end and when they were kissing, the gay couple. But uh, the, the one oddity was the, the one pregnant woman who suddenly in the laughter shot, it was two of them. It's actually her and her sister. Um, and uh, there was no thought behind that. It, it just, 
So when I go out and, and, and work, I try to be open to what is. I try to not uh, write down beforehand exactly what's going to happen. A lot of people like to work with storyboards and, and say exactly what's going to happen. But I, I try to stay away from storyboarding because I think it kills the spontaneity of what is. Uh, and in the particular case, when I was filming the uh, Disa, is her name, the pregnant uh, woman, her sister was there as well and was also pregnant. And so we just did a fun thing, a portrait of them together. And then of course, when they were together, they couldn't stop laughing. Um, and so we just had to, to put that in the film. So it's just a little bit of an oddity that has no explanation other than the one I guess just gave, I think. <laughs> Back to you, Archie. I was muted. Um, yeah, so there's really no other questions. Um, should I get back to Fritzi's? Um, there's some have been popping up some more questions during during this session. And um, do you think I should give her one? Yeah, of course. The the Q and A is for everybody on here. It's not only for the film we just saw. So for Charles or for Fritzi or for anybody. Even for Mike, the technician, anybody has a question for Mike, I'll pass yeah. it on to him and we'll set it up. Perfect. Um, so one question that uh, came up was, and that many have commented on that they wanted to, to hear the answer to this question is, uh, how do you get the prisoners uh, and the stuff they find? Um, um, no, how do you get the prisoners and the stuff to find the will to join the program? Um, most people in prison want to be in programs. There's wait lists for most of the programs that, that exist um, just to get out of their cells. Um, one of the, pr the, the prison that we filmed at on this yard is called an honor yard. And they agree not to do any shenanigans like no cell phones, no gang activity, no drugs. And for that privilege, they get unlimited programs. The yard that I piloted my program at, um, at Kern Valley State Prison, it's a maximum security. The men are in their cells 23 hours a day, um, every day of their life. They have another, they have a celly with them, but if they have a job, they're allowed out. And if they have programs, they're allowed out. So um, we, our program was seven hours. We would go up there. It was, it's two and a half hours from Los Angeles. So we would leave at five in the morning, get there at eight, um, armed with loads of snacks because the food they eat there is, is, is actually another form of punishment, if you ask me. Um, so we would bring them as many delightful treats as we could and stay there as long as we could to keep them out of their cells and, you know, so we could change our lives and their lives. Um, but I have a question for Charles, if I may, because I, I can never get enough of Charles on this call or any other call. And it's kind of relating to um, what you said about adopt a prison and you kind of were saying it just takes one person to shift. But if we don't make bigger efforts, how, how, I understand it starts with us. I understand we have to be the change we wanna see in the world, I get it. But if we don't go, go big, so I'm just, I'm like, you know, I don't wanna disappoint you, but I wanna go big. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, this is, um, I'm definitely not saying don't go big, uh, but I'm saying you don't have to go big to have a big influence on a 500 year time scale. So that allows you to trust what is mine to do in that situation. And, you know, perhaps you have a history and gifts and, and resources that, that answer the question, what is mine to do? in a way, yeah, I want to do this big program. Like, you know, I mean, I, I have my, my gifts are I'm good with words and I perceive patterns. So, you know, I, like I'm, so I, you know, I'm a writer and, and a speaker and that, but that's not because I made some calculation. Well, in order to have a big impact, I better do this. It's just the uh, natural expression of my particular circumstances and gifts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, this conversation has to continue in another form because I've got a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's talk some time. We'll we'll, we'll uh, 
we'll be in touch. Yeah. <laughs> Can I jump in for a second? Uh, I was on a um, um, uh, in the audience at a speech that uh, not speech. What is it called? We'll call it speech for now. That Charles gave um, in my community here in Sweden, and he had the most beautiful. Maybe Charles, you would like to repeat this or do it in a different way. I don't know. But you had this amazing, beautiful thing that you said about Nelson Mandela's grandmother. Do you remember? If you do, you, could you <laughs> could you do? Yeah, that? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you ask, well, who is the most important person in the history of South Africa? Most people would say it was Nelson Mandela. Uh, who s almost single-handedly, it seemed, uh, turned a timeline that would have been toward vengeance and bloodshed toward one of peace. Uh, and, and, and wow, what an incredible human being. Thank God for Nelson Mandela. However, if we ask the story, what is it like to be you, we might discover that the reason that he was able to hold peace through all those decades in prison and I'm making this up, okay, I actually don't know that much about Nelson Mandela, but maybe it was because of his grandmother who poured so much love into him when he was little that it gave him that inner resource. So maybe the most important person in the history of South Africa was Nelson Mandela's grandmother. So this doesn't, so, so basically what I'm saying here in, in the context of Fritzi's comment is that, that Nelson Mandela's grandmother like she didn't, her circumstances and gifts were um, perfectly placed to have a big effect. And all she had to do was to step into that gift, into her, which was motivated by love. And Nelson Mandela, so I'm not saying, well, he should have just, you know, been, you know, a doting father. No, like his circumstances and gifts made him a great leader. But we, sh we cannot see him as more important than everybody who made him who he was. And so like this, this, this teaching really is just to liberate us to trust what our heart tells us is ours to do. And um, yeah, so it's, it's a state of trust. Yeah. In the same, we could also say, um, the problem with our society is Trump's father, right? We, it, that's the same. <laughs> yep. And well, yeah, and then, you know, you trace the line of trauma back, <laughs> you know? And, and we would so much, like in the modern mind, we so much want to find the culprit, the source of evil, because then the solution is easy. Then we just eradicate it. You know, that's the Hollywood movies tell us how to solve a problem. You find the bad guy, you kill the bad guy, problem solved. <laughs> That's where we have been, an endless war on bad guys. So yeah, let's try something else. I have another question for you, if I may. Uh, I just keep, I just wanna, so in, your, in the coronation, you're, you stipulate that we can have really fast change. We can have like, things are speeding up and it feels like for me, it, like just getting that film made was it, it happened within two, like three weeks it all happened. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it, to me, it's confirmation that what I'm doing is right. So how do you see it speeding up and how, wh what confirmations are you seeing? Well, we can have fast change, but that doesn't mean we will. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, this would be a longer conversation. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't think things look like they're going in a good direction right now. Um, and I, it doesn't seem like we, like the, we have the potential for fast change, but in fact, we are intensifying the world of separation as a society. Uh, we are intensifying the world of separation of control of domination uh, of war uh, in many ways. Under the surface, a shift of consciousness is gathering force. Um, but outwardly, I, I think that we are um, going to go through quite uh, an initiation, quite an ordeal uh, before things get better. But that's a much longer conversation. Yeah. 
turn. I'm going to jump in and say that we have about five minutes left. Uh, and I'd like to ask Archie if there's one more question that you can bring forth from the pile. If there is a pile, I don't know. There is actually a, a pile gathering up here. Um, and one of them is to, to Charles. Um, what is, in your own experience, is holding back um, to really ask the question fully, the question, what is, what is it like to be you? Oh, for me, what holds me back is usually some kind of pain um, that is calling for my attention and div diverts my attention to looking, looking for that in another person. And I think on a societal level, the same is true. Um, maybe people are not ready, are not ready yet to ask that question. But I think actually people are, are ready. Um, it, on the internet, things look more polarized and more vitriolic than ever. But that's the internet and I wonder how deep it actually goes. Um, I, I was on some conversation with somebody who, who had been a campaign worker and, and she said like all these houses she went to and got into these conversations, she said, people so much wanted to unite. They wanted for the, the division to be over. They were caught up in, sometimes they get caught up in their opinions and, and, and these narratives that are foisted upon us by the media, but those, you know, and, and if you just look at the media, they seem to be a, 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 a totalizing uh, condition, um, but maybe it doesn't go as deep as it looks. Maybe things aren't as bad as they seem. Um, yeah. Nice, hopeful way to close up this call. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me here. This beautiful conversation that I'm sure could go on for hours, uh, but it's not going to because it's, it's bedtime in Sweden. I don't know what time it is and where you guys are, but it's time to wrap it up, people. Um, before I go, before we all go, I'd like to say a, a deep thank you to Tim from Films for Action. And um, you can go to filmsforaction.org, I believe is the URL, and watch these two films that you just saw here and 5,000 other films. Um, you can also go to Campfire Stories, which is campfire-stories.org. We'll put all these links somewhere in comments. Um, you can go there and from tomorrow, the not Fritz's film, but uh, our film will be available there. Uh, along with other films, there's one film where I meet Charles Eisenstein and he visits me and we have a conversation in my kitchen. It's called An Unlearning. That's a nice one to begin with. Um, thank you, everybody else. Thanks, Mike, for running the controls here, making sure everything is running smoothly. Thank you, Boris, for, for being here and for all the beautiful work that you and I do together. Thank you, Archie, for moderating this call. Thank you, Fritzi, so much for being here and sharing your project. Um, that's everybody, right? Wouldn't it be terrible if I left one person out? I think that's everybody. Very nice work, Matthias. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. yeah, that was lovely. Really happy to, to yeah. do that. And great to meet you, um, Fritzi, also. Uh, yeah, let's be in touch. I want to want to get your film more watched. I'm going to, so I want to do something about that. Yeah. Okay. So I'll beautiful. Take yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you so much everybody. And I hope to see you all at some point again, live or through a screen or in whatever way we can. Take care everybody. Bye. Thank you.